All right, so I'm just gonna get the presentation started now as we get a few more people coming in. So my name is Mike Wei. I am a CCFPEM resident currently based in Windsor for the year. And I am gonna be talking to you for the next 45 minutes or so about providing palliative care in the emergency department. So my presentation is provided by Dr. Jason Lam and I have no conflicts or any uh, anything else to disclose. Uh, starting off, I always want to list a, a few objectives. The ones I want to review, which I think are important for the next hour, is re uh, reviewing a goals of care discussion in the emergency department, reviewing the pharmacological symptomatic management for palliative, palliative care patients, identifying and caring for the actively dying patient in the emergency department, and also just highlighting some of the changes to palliative care that we may have experienced with COVID-19. So thinking about why we need to know about palliative care as emergency physicians, based on some recent statistics, up to 40% of patients with end of life concerns present to the emergency department within their last two weeks of life. And based on another study in Ontario, 83% of patients who die from cancer visits an emergency department within the last two, uh, at least twice within the last six months of their lives. So we encounter these patients frequently as part of our practice. They present with different complaints than what we, what we find from our typical emergency department patients and the way we approach these patients is actually quite different a lot of the time because of the varying goals of care that each one may have. Therefore, I think it's important for us to know what to expect and to be competent with management of their care. As to what the Royal College and the CFPC wants, so within the Royal College uh, list of objectives, they listed providing end of, uh, end of life care for a patient as their one training objective related to palliative care, which is fairly all encompassing, but also a bit vague. Within the CCFPEM program, there's no formal objective listed, although that comes with the expectation that all the CCFP residents have completed their family medicine training and most family medicine programs have palliative care as a component of their core curriculum. And the residents usually have come through rotation within palliative care at some point. So within Canada, based on a recent survey, 38.5% of e emergency medicine programs have a structured palliative care education curriculum. And one program has a mandatory palliative care rotation. So as you can see, there's not a lot of formal education time, especially, uh, especially rotation times devoted specifically to palliative care and residents are somewhat just expected to pick up on the skills as they go through their emergency medicine training through both the emergency department and the medicine subspecialties that they are rotating through. So just starting off our presentation today, we always like to frame it around a certain kind of case. So we have a patient who you see the triage note of in your ED today. Uh, the guy is a 73-year-old man. He's presenting with advanced metastatic lung cancer, and he's from home with EMS complaints of shortness of breath. The family mentioned he's not been really getting out of bed at all over the last week, and he's been having fairly limited PO intake. And the triage nurse bothered checking for you, and the patient does not have an advanced care directive. His vitals are essentially normal except for an elevated respirate. So when looking at our patient here, we know that, again, he has metastatic lung cancer. And our initial assessment, as always for any patient, is stable or unstable. Currently, our patient appears mostly stable. But if he was acutely unstable, then we would obviously go ahead and look at, does he have an advanced care directive planned? A lot of the time, patients who have known advanced cancer comes with a detailed plan if they were to present to the hospital about what they would want to have done 
and it can go into specifics as well. So we will always want to refer to that if that is available and the patient may also have it with them as well. If the patient is stable, we can proceed on towards our initial assessment. So there was an acronym that we liked from one of the, I think it's Dr. Brent Thoma from Canadian EM, and he calls it the ABCDs of palliative care. Basically, like we have the ABCs of acute management and trauma, we have the ABCDs here. A stands for advanced care directive, as mentioned earlier, we want to we want to see if the patient has an advanced care directive. And if they do, we want to review it with the patient to again make sure it is accurate and reflects their wishes. B just stands for better and it's treating the patient, making them feel symptomatically better. C stands for caregivers. As we know, a lot of patients who are at the end of their life are presenting with a caregiver, with someone, and usually someone in their family who's very familiar with what they have been going through and who's able to provide collateral history for what the patient has been going through as well to let us better understand their condition. D stands for decision-making capacity and basically assesses for whether the patient can be their own decision-makers or contact their substitute decision-makers if available. So it's a quick assessment, but it lets us get on top of what the plan is for this patient and as well as managing them acutely with their symptoms at this time. So looking at patients presenting near the end of their life, they should usually fit in one of these graphs. I think most of us have seen this before, but essentially they reflect the different pathways one could reach the end of life trajectory. So in the top left corner, we have the patient who presents some yield and dies immediately from a fairly high level of function. This is our traumas. This is our just sudden mass of acute illnesses and there's really not much from a palliative perspective. Going more into the specifics with the other three courses, number one at the top, we have our patients who are progressing at a fairly high level until at some point they reach a steady decline of which there's a predicted course towards death. This is the case with most metastatic or incurable cancers where the patient would continue at their relatively high baseline for a certain amount of time, but have a steady and usually not prolonged decline over a short period of time. In the second example, the one in the middle, this is our patient who presents sick to the hospital several times from either an ongoing or worsening chronic disease. That's our lung disease or COPD or CHFers or advanced liver disease patients who presents maybe a few times a year for hospital admissions. Each time they may recover to a slightly lower baseline until during one of these admissions they may just suddenly deteriorate and die. So for these patients, often death can seem to be a surprise because up to them, it seems that each time they are admitted, they've gotten better and they got them back home. So it can be surprising for some, both the patients and the family. Lastly, in the bottom of the gra uh, graph here, we have our patients who have a poor baseline to begin with, our frail patients. These are patients with dementia, patients from long-term care with significant deficits. They have a poor baseline and essentially they are just moving along at that poor baseline until you, they just almost expire at the end of their life. So with these three courses of illness, these are the type of patients who if we see we're presenting within one of these presentations near the end of their life, it may be important for us to consider discussing their prognosis with. So with um, whether it's a cancer or advanced cardiac disease, heart failure, advanced liver disease, 
there are many predictive models and predictive scores out there, but we don't even need to get into the specifics because we do know that whether a disease is likely to be terminal, whether the disease is curable, and how their expected function may be over the next several months to a year. So based on what we know about the disease, how the patient is currently functioning, and if there is any consults or previous specialist visits available as well as admissions that we can find in our systems, we can often just determine a general prognosis for the patient, whether they should be expecting to get back to the baseline or whether we believe the disease course will eventually take their life at some point in the future. It doesn't have to have exact time again, but just a general course of illness. There are some also predictive scores which are well validated, such as the heart failure scores. And for the patients who are very much near the end of their life, there are scores such as the palliative performance scale. And it's a quite simple model here where we just have a simple factor such as level of consciousness, whether the patient is able to take care of themselves and how they're functioning. And based on that, coming up with a score to estimate how much longer their expected survival is. So based on the chart here, you can see in the bottom right corner, that's where the expected medium survival rate, rate is based on the patient's palliative performance scale. That's based on three different studies, and these were all for patients who were admitted to hospital. So you can see it's more accurate, well, more specific near the bottom where the patient's PPS is around 20 or 30 percent, they're expected to have usually a median of a week to less survival date. Another scale that's well used and well validated is the ECOG scale, which is more well, which is applicable to cancer patients. And essentially it assesses kind of the same thing as the PPS for patients with a score of four. So those who are basically completely disabled and cannot do any of their own self-care, totally confined to a bed, their estimated medium survival rate is 25 days. So we have these models to really guide us on what the prognosis is with patients. And we should incorporate that into our prognosis when we discuss our expectations with our patients. So, and it's difficult for many people to try to have the conversation in the emergency department with a patient near the end of their life or being admitted for just advanced care regarding their goals of care. So I know for me as a, when I first started residency, having this conversation felt a lot more difficult than it does now. And I always try to avoid talking about the specifics or really try to avoid the negatives, try to game. And as I have more experience with it, I think it becomes more important to just know how to have this conversation and begin the conversation with the patient. So this is a chart I have, which is borrowed from uh, the, the Ottawa group, and it's a how-to guide for discussion at the end of their life for a patient presenting to the ED. So looking at the top, for a patient who is not acutely unstable that needs acute interventions, a question that we should be asking ourselves is, would you be surprised if the patient died within the next six months? So for a very frail, a well patient who you may think no. And that may be a time to bring up the subject of goals of care with our patient. So these discussions don't have to all take place at the same time, but it's important to bring it up to the patient so it's not a surprise to them when it's really brought up at a later point for discussion. We can bring in, in, up an idea of what they want, what they expect, and also just offer further discussions for them later on down the line when we don't need them to make a decision acutely in the ER at this point. So for patients, we 
know who may have some acute intervention required in the ED, such as if, they, uh, if they're acutely unwell, who are end up, who may be intubated. We wanna ask ourselves, how is this patient going to do in the future? So if our patient's known to be dying of terminal disease or metastatic advanced cancer, gentlemen, in our scenario, we would want to talk to our patient about the course of illness. So this is something that they will not recover from and they will pass away from. For these patients, we wanted them to get informed consent from our patients and discuss with palliative care. We'll discuss with our patient regarding approach to palliative care. And basically, for many of these patients, these ideas have been brought up already. And if you're the first one to bring these ideas up, then it's important to give the patient time to consider these choices and also spend the time with the patient to talk about what they want. Now, going forward, if our patient is not known to be dying from a terminal disease and they may require acute intervention, what did we want to think about what the patient wants and their values are with regards to their quality of life and what they want for near their death. So this again involves just having the conversation with our patient, talking about what they would want for the end of their life and what they expect to have. So for many patients, they may say want to die at home or they be, may want to be with loved ones. And to have that, being intubated in an ICU may not necessarily be the best option. So by understanding what the patient wants, we can tailor the care towards what our patient would like towards, uh, to having at the end of their life. That's kind of what we want to talk about with goal-oriented patient, patient assessment. So based on the patient's goals for the end of their life, we want to make our assessments and uh, suggest the appropriate managed plan, management plan for the patient for the end of their life. So here is just a few points which are important to follow through when we are talking to our patient in such a situation. Number one is that we want to communicate our prognosis clearly. I think this is one thing I had trouble with as an early on resident as well, where I wasn't really fully communicating the prognosis because I either felt like I wasn't knowledgeable enough or I didn't want to go that specific into specific with our patient. But we want to let the patient know whether this disease is curable, whether this is something that will likely end up causing them to pass away at the end. We don't want to make, <clears throat> sorry, we want a conversation to be clear. We don't want our patient to be confused about what we're telling them because this is probably one of the more important conversations we would have with our patient here. So number two, we want to engage the patient themselves or their surrogates or their caregivers by getting an understanding of their goals of care. And to, to, to do this, we want to ask open-ended questions about what the patient and what's important to the patient. So questions like, what is quality of life to you? What is important to you? What type of treatments you may be hoping to avoid? And what are you afraid of? These are questions we can ask to get a better understanding of what the patient's goals are at the end of their life. There are many patients who may say they have seen loved ones who were end up in the ICU intubated and pass away and they were not able to say goodbye. And that's something they actively wanted to avoid. So that will give you a clearer idea of what this patient's wishes may head towards to. Now, when we're talking to our patients, again, we wanna use our words wisely. There are certain negative phrasings that we will generally want to avoid because they can make patients feel abandoned or it feels like we're not trying to treat them. So words like, do you want us to withdraw care? Do you want us to not do anything? I've heard those things said before. And 
they give a negative connotation because it sounds like to the patient, you are avoiding doing things for them at the end of their life. So it's important to use the right words to reflect what you're trying to say. And we want to work with the patient to determine a plan for the end of their life that's congruent with their wishes. So that involves recapping what you uh, what they said to you just to have a better understanding and to have the patient confirm to you what the plan is. We want to confirm our plan with the patient and their decision makers if that's what uh, they have to really <clears throat> have more formalized discussion. And it's important to let the patient know that they are still in full control of what they want to have happen. I think if at some point they feel like the care they're receiving is no longer worthwhile, or if it's not enough, then they are always able to talk to us or his treatment team to update or adjust their goals of care. So <clears throat> moving on from the goals of care discussion, I wanna talk about symptom management for palliative care patients as well. So within London uh, and within CCTC where I wrote it through, basically you have your order set, you check off a few boxes and that's pretty much it for our orders at the end of uh, for palliative care. So I think it's also important to get to know some of the medications that we need to use and why we use them. So one of the most distressing complaints for patients who are at the end of life is dyspnea. That is also what our uh, simulated patient here is coming in here as well. So the first thing we do is again, look for the advanced care directive and treat within the patient's goals of care. So if the patient still wants to treat reversible causes, so things like anemia, pleural, massive pleural effusions, and that's treating this as within their goals of care, then we want to address the reversible causes. Now the mainstays for dyspnea are opioids. And opioids can be given IV, sub-Q, or PO, but in an acute scenario where the patient is very acutely dyspneic and near the end of their life, we want to use IV just for its faster mechanism of action. So we usually start with morphine or hydromorphone in the opioid naive patients. We would start with two to five milligrams IV. We can give this every five to 10 minutes and to titrate for comfort based on the patient's work or breathing. So the mechanism of how opioids actually address dyspnea is still not fully clear, but suggestions are that it reduces the patient's ability to perceive the feeling of shortness of breath. Benzos are another option, and it's more for the anxiety related to their dyspnea, which can maybe worsening their feedback loop. So, your favorite benzos, whether it's lorazepam or midazolam, there are all good options. One thing I've read is about using a low dose ketamine for the very acutely distressed patient, just to have it on board until the opioids are, and the benzos have kicked in to address their symptoms. Now that may work, but there, there's also the downside of patients who, once the ketamine wears off, started having the side effects for ketamine. So more delirious, more agitated, nausea. And so that's still not a fully suggested option, but it's something to consider. There are some pitfalls again when addressing dyspnea, which is for the acutely terminally ill patients who's presenting very dyspneic, Sometimes we avoid using opioids because their initial blood pressure is low or 80 or 50 or something low. So for these patients, we need to give them opioids to address their symptoms because they are at the end of their life. And we shouldn't even keep on checking their blood pressure anyways if they're fully palliative because the more important thing for them is to treat their symptoms and make them comfortable 
we want to be able to use opioids not just to treat their respirate, but we also want to look at their work of breathing. So if the patient is struggling hard to breathe and they're having significant work and anxiety associated with it, then we need to treat their symptoms, not just based on their respirate. We want to keep in mind the onset of action for the medications. So with oral, it can be up to 60 minutes for it to work. With sub-Q, 20 to 30 minutes. And with IV, five minutes. So we don't need to give consecutive doses without waiting for the previous dose to even kick in. And lastly, you want to use opioids as the first line because giving benzos that just only treats the patient's anxiety, but it, it doesn't necessarily address their underlying shortness of breath and their symptoms. So another quite distressing symptom for more so for the family who are at the bedside with the patient are secretions. So death rattles, if you've heard them, they are disconcerting and they're quite distressing to the family if they not, if the family doesn't know what is going on. This comes from the turbulence, which is produced by the ventilation from the patient's airway due to them not being able to clear the secretions. And with the onset of death rattles, the medium time to the onset of death is usually about 16 hours. To treat secretions, we use glycopyrrolate and scopolamine as our two main methods. So glycopyrrolate is a little more preferred now as it does not cross the CNS barrier, so it doesn't cause more sedation or delirium than scopolamine, which does cross the uh, blood-brain barrier. Atropine is another option as just for reducing secretions, but glycopyrrolate and scopol uh, scopolamine are usually the go-tos. For secretions like this, it's suggested that we avoid suction because suctioning most of the time would not work. And suctioning can also cause some further bleeding to the patient's airway, and that can be even more distressing for both the patient and the family. So patients with cancer pain, they're already on very high doses of pain medications. So the whose pain ladder doesn't necessarily apply right here, because when we see them, many of them will be on high, high doses of opioids both long-acting and short-acting. Patients may be on multiple opioids with fentanyl patches, hydromorph, plus breakthrough doses. So the way we treat our patient's pain when they present to the ED acutely is we want to give them breakthrough doses. They can be up to 20% of the patient's total daily opioid dose. So we want to calculate their morphine equivalents based on all the opioids they are using and give breakthrough doses based on that. And for patients who we may be sending home, we want to, again, address their underlying uh, pain. So by looking at how often the patient is requiring PRNs, they may be needing longer acting opioids rather than more frequent short acting opioids. Some of the patients who are on very high doses of opioids can be presenting to the hospital with opioid toxicity as well. So symptoms of decreased, GC, uh, decreased LOC, nausea, vomiting, constipation, urticaria, myoclonic jerks, or opioid-induced hyperalgesia. These are all possible complaints from just being on such high doses. So to treat this, we would confer uh, the patient to an alternate opioid. So from morphine to hydromorph or vice versa. Usually with these conversions, again, we wanna calculate the patient's opioid equivalent doses into morphine. And initially to decrease by 25%, just to, uh, due to cross reactivity. So if the patient was on 30, well, let's go with better numbers, 100 milliliter equivalents of morphine daily, and we want to transfer them to hydromorphone, then we would go to 75 milliliter equivalents. We want to ensure the patients have PRNs available for this transition and to titrate up as needed. <laughs>
Lastly, one of the other main symptoms is nausea. So our go-tos for treating nausea, same as anywhere else, gravel, undansetron, metoclopramide. For our palliative care patients here, Haldol and Nosenans or, or antipsychotics can work fairly well for nausea as well. For certain specific indications, we can give dexamethasone. And for patients who are again very anxious, benzos are another option to add on along with this. With a patient here uh, in the ED, <clears throat> we want to be able to identify if they are actively near the end of their life and they may be requiring palliative care and merge up in the emergency department. So certain signs of the end of life are patients who are presenting with very decreased GCS, not able to close their eyelids, and a lot of respiratory symptoms like grunting of the vocal cords, chain stokes respirations, apneic pauses, patients who are cyanotic to their extremities with mottled knees. These are all signs of patients who will be passing away quite soon. So for these patients, palliating in the emergency department is what's the more likely option, unless the center that you're working at is to get patients transfer up to admitted beds, private rooms very quick, which is often not the case. So COVID has made this more difficult that before COVID, we would always try to get these patients private rooms if possible and allow family to be at the bedside to be with the patient for the end of their life. For our actively dying patient, we want to discontinue our monitoring and our IVs just to avoid the beeps, the extra sounds, and we want to change our medications to be via the sub-Q route. For the dying patient, we want to have close nurse monitoring to ensure the patient is <clears throat> the patient has full symptomatic control and also to guide the family through what is happening near the end of their life. For patients who may have a cardiac defibrillator, it's important to deactivate the defibrillator. And for us in the ER, sometimes that just means putting a magnet over top because as the patient is dying, we don't want the defibrillator to go off and give them shocks which is both distressing to the patient and their family. So here is a chart just kind of addressing some of the main concerns families may have at the end of their life for the acutely actively dying patient. So the majority of the time, they're going to be refusing to eat anything peel, and the family may be asking you to start fluids, or to start other things to help feed them. And the important thing for us to, is to educate the family, let them know that there is no role for fluids and it doesn't do anything for the patient to make them comfortable. What we can do is to give them artificial saliva, tears, and whatever small amounts that they may desire. Patients who are at, end of, who are at the end of their life will be having cardiac and respiratory uh, renal dysfunction so they may be cyanotic, the extremities are cold, their knees are modeled. Again, we only treat for comfort, we keep the patient comfortable, we give them blankets and just keep them comfortable. There's no role for any acute intervention to address these issues. Patients who are very drowsy, disoriented, and just with uh, presenting with decreased neurological function. We want to explain to the family that, again, this is what is expected at the end of life. We want the family to be at their bedsides and sometimes the patient may need some atypical antipsychotics or uh, benzos just to keep them from being very restless. For secretions, respiratory dysfunction and pain, we've just talked about those earlier. We want to treat these symptoms with our medications and we want to give frequent doses if needed. 
because these patients are actively dying and their goal is to keep them comfortable. So this position for our actively dying patient is based on what we expect the course to be. So if the patient is imminently dying and within the next few hours, the most sensible option is probably to palliate in the emergency department. For the patient who is not imminently dying, they would need admission. So at the UH, it would be to medicine and it would be to palliative or medicine epic. At other centers, it's usually the hospitalist or the palliative care service who would take these patients. For patients who are discharged home because they wish to die at home, then we need to make the referral to palliative care if they do not already have a plan in place to arrange for proper follow-up for these patients at their home. And it's important to consult our services that we have available at whatever center we're working with, whether it's palliative care, social work, home care, just to have the supports and care the patient needs for the end of their life should they choose to go home. So lastly, I just wanna address palliative care during COVID-19, which has been going for, um, for over a year now. And COVID patients presenting to the emergency department requiring palliative care is something that I think many of us have encountered as well. So with this pandemic, people are, I guess, a lot more acutely aware of what's going to happen with ventilators and the ICU. So patients who are in more severe respiratory distress and they know they have their COVID, they often are expecting the discussion about whether they would want ventilators and ICUs and the prolonged care that they may require in the hospital. So it's important to talk with these patients, get to know the plans, get to know what they would like, and really have a proper goals of care discussion. Now, the mortality rate for COVID for patients who submitted to the ICU, it's, steadily, um, uh, it's been steadily coming down since the initial waves. So now the most recent numbers that I found online is down to about 20% to upwards of 35%. Uh, so it's still not insignificant. And with COVID, the intubation course is usually fairly prolonged. Patients are extremely deconditioned and they are kept in hospital for a very <clears throat> long admission, at which time they can develop some significant comorbidities and comorbid conditions. So it's important to let our patient understand what they may be expecting near the end of their life if they choose to go through intubation and the ICU. Because for the very chronically ill, the unwell patients, they can be expecting just a prolonged severe admission. And the chances of them returning to their baseline is quite limited. In terms of addressing symptoms acutely, we still want to manage our patient's symptoms as I previously mentioned with the symptom management slides, but we want to avoid aerosolizing techniques and also keep the patient in a negative pressure setting if possible. We want to make sure our nursing colleagues and ourselves have proper PPEs if we're going to be caring for the patient and avoiding again, the nebulized treatments like high flow oxygen, CPAP, BiPAP, nebulizer treatments and fans. So having the patient's family at bedside is a center dependent uh, thing where some centers may allow the uh, family to be at the bedside if the family is also COVID positive, whereas other centers would not. Uh, nonetheless, I think most places would offer video chats with the family and to have the family on the phone if needed. So that is again very center dependent, but it is important for these patients to at least have some way of speaking to their family or contacting their family near the end of their life. Sometimes the patients who choose to be intubated when go to ICU, we want to have them 
family at the bedside or on the phone, just as a chance to say goodbye, because again, there's a significant mortality rate associated with patients who are intubated. So we want to prepare them for that possibility and prepare the family as well. So I think that is the end of my presentation. If there's any more suggestions or just comments about the COVID-19 and palliative care, please uh, let me know. Hey, Mike, that was a really great presentation. Um, in your sort of travels, did you come across any sort of one pagers about an approach to putting in an order set or, or something that would be sort of a handy guide to keep on our phones or something along those lines? So I have um, not really seen any specific order sets because every center I've had worked at have their own order set that's already made up. So we always want to have the, <clears throat> uh, the symptomatic treatments available for our main symptoms. So I don't think there's anything else I can add on to that. Basically, make sure we have our medical management available. I think our CCTC order sets and the London Emerge order sets are all pretty good because they have everything um, there as well. Yeah, I can comment on that a little bit. We're lucky in London in that we do have the power plant, so it's easy to put in the comfort care and palliative care or sets. I think the main medications um, to keep in the back of your head would be mainly opioids and benzodiazepines because they help with both pain and dyspnea. Um, and then the dosing is quite frequent. So because they're a palliative patient, we want to keep them comfortable. It's every two few minutes uh, sub Q. The nurses can insert like a sub Q butterfly and just leave it there. And then you can keep dosing it every few minutes until they're comfortable. And then just to add, um, Luckett had put in the comments that um, if there's a patient that has a pacemaker as well, you don't want to use a magnet because then that takes away the sensing function of the pacemaker and it just automatically paces, which um, probably is not uh, helpful either. So if it's ICD only, then you put the magnet on, but uh, otherwise uh, don't put the magnet on. Yeah, otherwise, if there's no other questions, uh, thanks, Mike, for presenting on kind of palliative care. It's a very topical um, situation now. So, uh, and then Elena has a comment that there's an app available called Pallium. So I think we'll end it there unless there's any other questions. Okay, thanks, everyone.